1938, Fannie Mae comes into existence, right? And it's chartered by the US government <clears throat> as a way to ensure reliable and affordable supply of mortgage funds throughout the country. So if you think about this, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae, let's say for example, Scott Grove starts a bank in the 20s, right? And I wanna lend money to my buddy Chris DeRosa to buy a house. Well, if Chris is buying a, a farm out in, uh, I don't know, Overland Park, Kansas, and in 1930, 1928, it's gonna be $50,000, and I have $50,000, I can give Chris $50,000, and he'll pay me back over the course of 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, whatever we agree to. He can pay me back that $50,000, and he'll pay me a rate of interest, you know, five, six, seven, 10, 12%, whatever, and I will make back every month some of my principal, a return on principal, and I will make back some interest, right? And so if I have $50,000, great. Like I can lend him $50,000, I make back the money with my interest. But the problem is I'm entering into a long-term relationship with Chris, who maybe I don't know particularly well. And once I lend that $50,000 out the door, I can never lend it again, right? I, I can never spend, I can never, I can never lend that money out to another person again. So in the 30s, to help us come out of the Great Depression, the government sets up this government-sponsored enterprise. And they basically say, say okay, Scott, you, ain't, you own a bank and you have $50,000 on deposit and you want to lend that to Chris. The day after you lend that money to Chris, we will come in with a set of guidelines, which ended up becoming a set of underwriting guidelines. We will come in and we will reimburse you the $50,000, Scott, so that you can go out and re-lend that $50,000 to Karina, who's going to buy another house down the street. We will pay you a couple percentage points up front for the fact that you did that money. And we're willing to pay you money up front because us, the government sponsored enterprise, backed with the full faith and credit of the US government, we will hold that money in reserve. And we know Chris, even if he refinances, even if he dies, even if he loses a job and we have to foreclose, we have these mathematical models that show we're gonna get at least seven or eight years of interest out of him. So we'll pay you, you know, 300 basis points or three points up front, right? We'll pay you money up front on your $50,000 to buy that $50,000 of debt from you. So we'll give you uh, three points on $50,000 is uh, $1,500. We'll give you $1,500 up front right now to sell us that debt. And we'll also pay you like a quarter of a percent uh, every month uh, or annually. Uh, yeah, annually. We'll pay you a quarter of a percent annualized in order to collect his mortgage payments, you know, send out the mortgage statement, handle his customer service issues, and you just send us the full payment. You can peel off that little sliver for yourself. We call that a servicing fee. And you'll service the loan. Meaning as far as Chris knows, the Bank of Scott still has his mortgage. He's making his payments to us. We're taking off a small sliver, because remember, we already got some of our money up front. And then we'll turn around and send the rest of that payment to Fannie Mae. And Fannie Mae will pay off that debt and they'll collateralize it somehow on the back back end with government bonds and treasuries and, and selling the debt to pension funds and all kinds of crazy stuff happens behind the scene. But for our purpose, that's the goal, right? And the goal of Fannie Mae and then Freddie Mac and then Ginny Mae, who does that same exact process with FHA loans and VA loans, they came into an existence, they came into existence to create liquidity in the market. And that's a key term, liquidity in the market. Meaning that if I only have one round of $50,000 to lend, I lend it out one time and we're out of liquidity to make home loans. But if I can lend it to Chris and then Fannie Mae uh, pays me back with, with some additional points, some additional income. Then I lend it out to Karina. I sell the loan, Fannie Mae pays me back. Now I've got that $50,000 again, right? But now I've collected some, some interest from Chris, that little sliver called servicing. And I've collected my fees from Fannie Mae, the points that they're paying me up front to sell them the debt. So now my 50,000 turns to 53,000 and my 53,000 turns to 58,000. And before you know it, this is a pretty good racket for Scott Grove's bank to lend it out as quick as possible, as quick as possible in order to turn that money and churn that money. And all this time, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and Ginny Mae are basically portfolioing, 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 putting in their portfolio, uh, millions and then hundreds of millions and then billions and then trillions of dollars in mortgages. So Chris, maybe you could look this up. How many trillions of dollars of loans does Fannie Mae own in 2023? Or the numbers are probably most recently out for 2021 and 2022. 
how many trillions of dollars of mortgages does Fannie, Freddie, Ginny, pick one of them, Fannie Mae, uh, how much do they own? I guess it's a trillion dollars, trillions of dollars. Uh, I don't know. Let's check it out. All right. Well, we'll look that up. All right. So here comes the moral hazard, right? I'm making a lot of money by... Tw- tw- uh, 28 million homeowners. 28 million homeowners. So see how many trillions... Of, let's say the average home loan is 300,000. So, you know, 300,000 times 22 million. I don't know. You'll find the number in a minute. How many trillions of dollars are under management? Um, but here's the moral hazard, right? I want to lend out this money as quickly as possible because now I'm making those fees, Right for selling the loan and then selling the debt to Fannie Mae. I am also want as many loans in the door as possible so that Bank of Scott is servicing those loans, making that small quarter of a percent, half a percent, tenth of a percent, or whatever. I want a lot more loans. So Fannie Mae is going to come out and say, okay, Scott, we'll keep buying these loans as long as you follow a certain set of guidelines, right? And one of the ways, one of the ways, we're getting there, I promise. This is going to come full circle to the good thing that's happening in 2023. One of the ways that Fannie Mae will basically set fiscal policy and in some ways social engineering or social policy is they'll say, okay, Scott, because there's certain risk with certain deals, um, we're going to give you the guidelines for how you can underwrite these deals and and we're going to give you some risk based pricing. Risk-based pricing, that's a weird term, right? That means if Scott decides to lend to Chris on a single family residence, traditional first-time buyer, 20% down, the rate might be X. Oh, but Chris wants to put 10% down. The rate is going to be X plus a quarter of a percent. Oh, Chris wants to put 10% down, but buy a condo or a multi-unit property that is considered to have more chance of defaulting because, you know, a condo project or a condo unit, you don't own the whole project nor control that whole project. A multi-unit, maybe you get in trouble with one of your renters. So anything that's considered more risk, lower credit score, condo, multi-unit, something unique about the deal, less money down, self-employed, like all of these things have played into the formula at one time or another where Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will say, hey, we can't control the underlying rate because that has to do with what the bond market is doing, what interest rates throughout the market is doing, what type of risk we're willing to take, what type of risk the bank is trying to to take. We can't really control the rates, but what we can control is we can control the risk-based pricing add-ons to the rate. And so what we saw happen over the course of the last 70 or 80 years is a lot of manipulation of the fiscal policy and then, like I said, some weird social engineering, right? Because if they make it more expensive to buy this product, lenders will probably offer less of that product or consumers will take less of that product. If they make it cheaper for this type of product, consumers will probably take more of that product and banks will push more of that product, right? This is just your classic supply versus demand. And so what has happened in the last several years is that what's happened in the last several years is that the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae policies have, in my opinion, skewed too far in favor of wealthy buyers and wealthy households and wealthy Americans. And what I mean by that is we'll take the second home example, right? Until about 18 months ago, those risk-based pricing adjustments, right, or that social engineering or that fiscal control that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had by setting the standard to which lenders can loan, right, uh, which lenders can lend, and the standard by which pricing add-ons happen to the interest rate, they were really favorable for second homes, right? So, for example, you could buy a second home with 10% down and with the attention to only occupy it a certain number of days a year, Um, You could buy that with very few risk-based pricing add-ons, aka very few additions or hits to the interest rate. Well, guess what happened alongside that, right? All of a sudden, everybody in America, wealthier households that could afford to finance a second home, quote unquote, use that to fund their Airbnb portfolio. So if you look at the Airbnb kind of culture, the rise of that Airbnb entrepreneur, just go back and watch YouTube videos from four or five years ago. You'll see uh, uh, proponents of the Airbnb 
empire and entrepreneur path saying, hey man, this is all you got to do. Go into your bank, tell them you're buying a second home in Palm Springs or Lake Arrowhead or uh, the Smoky Mountains out by Dollywood or uh, Clearwater, Florida or all these places that used to have fairly affordable housing. Just go out to your lender Tell them you're going to buy this second home in a resort area. You'll only have to put 10% down. The interest rate will be awesome. The underwriting criteria will be surprisingly pretty good. And as long as you're wealthy enough to qualify for your primary residence and this second home without using any rental income, you can get in super cheap to an Airbnb and just start printing money Uh, by renting it out, even though you didn't finance it as a rental, right? You didn't put the 20 or 25% down versus the 10% down as a rental because rental properties, again, risk-based pricing, Fannie Mae guidelines, that all required more money down for a rental, higher interest rates for a rental, right? So I would say, I would say that one of the things, one of the things that really fueled the growth of the Airbnb ecosystem is the fact that the federal government was, well, let me take that back, a government-sponsored enterprise backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government, aka Fannie Mae, was basically providing super cheap, low money down lending products to consumers, wealthy consumers, to go finance property to turn them into a rental property and build their Airbnb empire. And I got to give a shout out to a buddy of mine named Mark. Uh, Mark's a really sharp guy, has done a lot of property investing in and out of uh, quite a few apartment buildings, uh, gets what I call a lot of mailbox money. He makes money just for the smart investments he's made. He said this a couple of years ago and he said, Scott, you know, a lot of people are arguing about whether this is a a buyer's market or a seller's market or whatever. He's like, I'm going to tell you something. It's a lender's market. The rapid rise of property values that we're seeing in areas that are that are being purchased as second homes, like areas of Florida, like areas in the Panhandle, like areas in resort towns, like areas in the Smoky Mountains, like areas all over California. He's like, those aren't fueled necessarily by smart underlying economics. That's not fueled by it being a seller's market or a buyer's market. It's fueled by the fact that the lenders are allowing deals to happen at such a low interest rate that it's gonna be interesting to see what happens when interest rates go from 2.75 to, we were thinking at the time, 4.75. Now they're closer to like 6.75 as of the first half of the year, 2023. And all of a sudden, these Airbnb properties aren't gonna make sense. All of a sudden, um, a lot of these apartment building complexes aren't gonna make sense. All of a sudden, the property valuation is gonna go down 20 or 30% because the cost of the debt to carry the property goes up. And sure enough, sure enough, About 18 months ago, Fannie and Freddie started catching up with the story that I'm telling you, and they said, wait a minute, our mission, I'm going to read Fannie Mae's mission here, Fannie Mae creates affordable housing opportunities throughout the country. We expand access to affordable mortgage loans and multifamily housing across, uh, uh, housing for millions of people across the U.S., right? Um, Freddie Mac, their mission statement. We serve American home buyers, homeowners, and renters by providing liquidity, stability, and affordability to the housing market. Jenny May's mission statement. Jenny May's mission is to link the United States housing market to the global capital markets, thus providing low-cost financing for federal housing programs. Okay? Nowhere in there does it say our mission is to finance wealthy people in buying more property cheaply. Like that's not their mission statement. The mission statement, the goal of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac was to help primarily first time home buyers get into houses and create liquidity in the market. So going all the way back to Bank of Scott, I could lend to Chris and then I could lend to Karina and then I could lend to Bill and then I could lend to Steven because they were buying the debt on the backside. But what happened is incentives matter, right? Incentives matter. And so when they accidentally or intentionally created this kind of web of pricing plus guidelines plus incentives and people caught on, right? Because the consumer is smart. Capitalism is smart. Money flows in a smart direction. When they figured out, oh, wait a minute, Fannie and Freddie are basically subsidizing us building our Airbnb empire. Guess what happened, right? 10 years an explosion of second home loans, an explosion of property values because 
this is my this is my one thing. I'm like, I'm of two minds here, right? I'm a capitalist, I'm a libertarian, so I'm like, well, the market will figure it out. And and I hate the fact that Airbnb basically through these cheap financing workarounds created by a government sponsored entity like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the fact that Airbnb was basically breaking the law for their first 10 years of existence because they were effectively creating hotels in areas that weren't zoned as hotels. What ended up happening is the the potential wealthy home buyer, landowner, um, uh, hedge fund, property rental, like basically the wealthier swath of America was able to come and be like, well, yeah, I know that this house right here is worth $500,000 as a single family residence to an individual family who's looking to buy it. But if I can underwrite it as a hotel, as a short-term rental, which is technically illegal, but who cares? I'm gonna get away with it because Airbnb is getting away with it. If I can underwrite it as a hotel, that basically means the value on the house goes from 500,000 to 650,000, right? So if you look at a lot of the areas where there's a concentration of Airbnbs, you will also see a correlated, I would think, I would argue causation, not correlation, but you will see a correlated rapid rise in property values, right? Because if I can go in and underwrite an asset as something that it wasn't intended to be, and then I can go to a government-sponsored entity like Fannie Mae and get super cheap financing on it, like this is this is a problem, right? A, a large percentage of value increases across America is because of this Airbnb, cheap money, bad incentives, web of risk-based pricing plus underwriting guidelines that made it super cheap for wealthy people to obtain more real estate, right? And again, I'm a libertarian, I'm a capitalist, I'm not trying to vilify or turn into villains wealthy people, but this was a bad mismatch of incentives and situations that happened over the last 10 years. So the story is that Fannie and Freddie, they finally figured it out, right? They finally went like, oh, we're financing something that's contrary to our mission statement of creating affordable housing and opportunities frequently reserved for first-time buyers throughout the marketplace. So 2023, long story, long backstory to get you to where we are now. And look, I don't really blame loan officers for not being able to tell this full story. I don't really blame realtors for just wanting to put up a post of, hey, mortgage insurance got cheaper. Hey, uh, the funding fee on VA loans got cheaper. Hey, uh, mortgage insurance on FHA loans got cheaper. I don't expect somebody to go through a 20 minute diatribe like I just did in order to explain this to people, but the story matters, right? The story matters because what's happening now is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae, they are trying to course correct. So if you're a first time buyer, if you fit into the low to moderate income bucket, meaning your uh, income for your household is below a certain percentage of the national average, if you're looking to use a VA loan or an FHA loan, the shit just got cheaper which is super cool, right? Fannie, Freddie, and Jenny are actually fulfilling their mission now, being like, well, rates went up dramatically over the last two years, 18 months. We can't really control the underlying rates because that would be market manipulation. But what we can do is we can make the mortgage insurance, we can make the funding fees, we can make the cost to acquire a loan, we can make the underwriting guidelines to acquire a home. We can make those all easier for your first time buyers, your low to moderate income housing, and we can increase the risk-based pricing add-ons. We can make the underwriting guidelines more complicated. We can make the, the down payments more, uh, um, make a larger requirement for the down payments if you're gonna do these things like buy a second home, buy a rental property, uh, buy investment condos, whatnot. So as much as I complain about the government and government sponsored entities like Fannie, Freddie, and Jenny are just extensions of uh, the government, normally I would shit on them and complain about them and I'd have nothing good to say about the government. Um, but in this case, I think it's good. I think they're finally adjusting to the realities of the market and they're adjusting to their original mission statement. And look, if you service really high cost areas like I do, Las Vegas, California, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, Summerlin, uh, Summerlin, Nevada, which is like right outside of Las Vegas. If you service those areas where your average loan amount is over a million dollars and you are working with wealthier people, the reality is those loans got a little bit more complicated. They got a little bit more pricey. You're having to search with a bunch of private lenders and individual banks to see who has the best deal. But if you're doing that kind of run of the mill, low to moderate income, um, entry level housing, 
uh, working with veterans and FHA buyers, which is about 30 to 40% of our business, that swath of business just got much easier. And kudos, rare kudos to the government and these government-sponsored agencies for at least living out the values of their mission statement and helping those people get into houses that have the hardest time getting into houses. Hey, Chris, do we ever find how much money is under management with Fannie Mae? I just found some Q4 information and it was in the billions. So uh, I it's got get the trillions. feeling that it's not. Yeah, that's probably billions in that for. one quarter. Yeah, um, probably. Let's see if I can find the stat real quick. There we go. Total assets, 4.23 trillion. Holy cow. $4 trillion just under Fannie Mae. And I would imagine Freddie Mac is just shortly behind them. And let's see if Ginny Mae has the same numbers easily accessible. Ginny Mae. Yep. And Freddie Mac has $2.2 trillion. Uh, oh, no. Ginny Mae has $2.2 trillion. So there's probably about $10 trillion of mortgage debt owned by Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny. So fascinating. 